However, I demurred in mind, I kept replaying the whole thing. Again, I stepped down from the platform and felt strange and hot and saw that chap stand up and toppled, not because a heckler pointed with his pipe, but probably because the time was ripe for just that bump and wobble on the part of a limp blimp and old unstable heart. My vision reeked with truth. It had the tone, liquidity, and the quaintness of its own reality. It was, as time went on, its constant vertical and triumph shone. Often when troubled by the outer glare of street and strife, inward I'd turn, and there, there in the background of my soul it stood, old faithful, and its presence always would console me wonderfully. Then one day I came across what seemed a twin display. It was a story in a magazine about a Mrs. Z whose heart had been rubbed back to life by a prompt surgeon's hand. She told her interviewer of, quote, the land beyond the veil, end of quote, and the account contained a hint of angels and a glint of stained windows and some soft music and a choice of hymnal items and her mother's voice. But at the end, she mentioned a remote landscape, a hazy orchard, and I quote, Beyond that orchard, through a kind of smoke, I glimpsed a tall white fountain and awoke. If on some nameless island, Captain Schmidt sees a new animal and captures it, and if a little later, Captain Smith brings back a skin, that island is no myth. Our fountain was a signpost and a mark, objectively enduring in the dark, strong as a bone, substantial as a tooth, and almost vulgar in its robust truth. The article was, was by Jim Coates. To Jim forthwith I wrote. Got her address from him, drove west 300 miles to talk to her, arrived, was met by an impassioned purr. Saw that blue hair, those freckled hands, that rapt, orchideous air, and knew that I was trapped. Who'd miss the opportunity to meet a poet so distinguished? It was sweet of me to come. I desperately tried to ask my questions. They were brushed aside. Perhaps some other time. The journalist still had her scribblings. I should not insist. She plied me with fruitcake, turning it all into an idiotic social call. I can't believe she said that it is you. I loved your poem in the Blue Review. That one about Mont Blanc. I have a niece who's climbed the Matterhorn. The other piece I could not understand. I mean the sense, because of course the sound. But I'm so dense. She was. I might have persevered. I might have made her tell me more about the white fountain we both had seen beyond the veil. But if I thought I mentioned that detail, she'd pounce upon it as upon a fond affinity, a sacramental bond, uniting mystically her and me. And in a jiffy, our two souls would be brother and sister trembling on the brink of tender incest. Well, I said, I think it's getting late. I also called on Coates. He was afraid he had mislaid her notes. He took his article from a steel file. It's accurate. I have not changed your style. There's one misprint. Not that it matters much. Mountain, not fountain. The majestic touch. Life everlasting based on a misprint. I mused as I drove homeward, take the hint and stop investigating my abyss. But all at once it dawned on me that this was the real point, the contrapuntal theme. Just this, not text, but texture. Not the dream, but topsy turvical coincidence. Not flimsy nonsense, but a web of sense. Yes, it sufficed that I and life could find some kind of link and bobo link, some kind of correlated pattern in the game, plexed artistry, and something of the same pleasure in it as they who played it found. It did not matter who they were, no sound, no furtive light came from their involute abode. But there they were, aloof and mute playing a game of worlds, promoting pawns to ivory unicorns and ebon fawns, kindling a long life here, extinguishing a short one there, killing a Balkan king, causing a chunk of ice formed on a high-flying airplane to plummet from the sky and strike a farmer dead, hiding my keys, glasses, or pipe, coordinating these events and objects with the remote events and vanished objects, Making ornaments of accidents and possibilities. Storm-coated, I strode in. Sybil, it is my first conviction. Darling, shut the door. Had a nice trip. Splendid. But what is more, I have returned convinced that I can grope my way to some... to some yesteryear. Faint hope. Canto 4. 
Now I shall spy on beauty as none has spied on it yet. Now I shall cry out as none has cried out. Now I shall try what none has tried. Now I shall do what none has done. And speaking of this wonderful machine, I'm puzzled by the difference between two methods of composing. A, the kind which goes on solely in the poet's mind, a testing of performing words while he is soaping a third time one leg, and B, the other kind, much more decorous, decorous, when he's in his study writing with a pen. In method B, the hand supports the thought, the abstract battle is concretely fought, the pen stops in midair, then swoops to bar a canceled sunset or restore a star and thus it physically guides the phrase toward faint daylight through the inky maze. But method A is agony. The brain is soon enclosed in a steel cap of pain, amused in overalls, directs the drill, which grinds and which no effort of the will can interrupt, while the automaton is taking off what he has just put on, or walking briskly to the corner store to buy the paper he has read before. Why is it so? Is it perhaps because in penless work there is no pen poised pause and one must use three hands at the same time, having to choose the necessary rhyme, hold the completed line before one's eyes and keep in mind all the preceding tries? Or is the process deeper with no desk to prop the false and hoist the, the poetesque? For there are those mysterious moments when too weary to delete I drop my pen. I ambulate, and by some mute command, the right word flutes and perches on my hand. My best time is the morning, my preferred season, midsummer. I once overheard myself awakening while half of me still slept in bed. I tore my spirit free and caught up with myself upon the lawn where clover leaves cupped the topaz of dawn and where shade stood in nightshirt and one shoe. And then I realized that this half, too, was fast asleep. Both laughed and I awoke safe in my bed as day its eggshell broke and robins walked and stopped and on the damp, gemmed turf a brown shoe lay. My secret stamp, the shade impressed, the mystery inborn, mirages, miracles, midsummer morn. Since my biographer may be too staid or know too little to affirm that shade shaved in his bath, here goes. He'd fixed a sort of hinge and screw affair a steel support running across the tub to hold in place, the shaving mirror right before his face, and with his toe renewing tap warmth, he'd sit like a king there and like Marat bleed. The more I weigh, the less secure my skin, in places it's ridiculously thin, thus near the mouth the space between its wick, and my grimace invites the wicked nick. Or this dewlap, some day I must set free the Newport frill inveterate in me. My Adam's apple is a prickly pear. Now, now I shall speak of evil and despair, as none has spoken. Five, six, seven, eight, nine strokes are not enough. Ten, I palpate through strawberry and cream, the gory mess and find unchanged to the patch of prickliness. I have my doubts about the one-armed bloke who in commercials with one gliding stroke clears a smooth path of flesh from ear to chin, then wipes his face and fondly tries his skin. I'm in the class of fussy bimantis, bimanists, as a discreet ephebe in tights assists, a female in an acrobatic dance. My left hand helps and holds and shifts its stance. Now I shall speak better than any soap is the sensation for which poets hope. When inspiration and its icy blaze, the sudden image, the immediate phrase over the skin, a triple ripple send, making the little hairs all stand on end, as in the enlarged animated scheme of whiskers mode when held up by our cream. Now I shall speak of evil as no none has spoken before. I loathe such things as jazz, the white-hosed moron torturing a black bull rayed with red abstractist bric-a-brac primitivist folk masks, progressive schools, music and supermarkets, swimming pools, brutes, boars, class-conscious Philistines, Freud, Marx, fake thinkers, puffed-up poets, frauds, and sharks. And while the safety blade with scrape and screak travels across the country of my cheek, cars on the highway pass and up the steep incline, big trucks around my jawbone creep, 
and now a silent liner docks, and now sunglasses tore Beirut, and now I plow old Zembla's fields where my gray stubble grows, and slaves make hay between my mouth and nose. Man's life is a commentary to abstruse, unfinished poem. Note for further use, dressing in all the rooms I rhyme and roam throughout the house with, in my fist, a comb or a shoehorn, which turns into the spoon I eat my egg with. In the afternoon, you drive me to the library. We dine at half past, half past six. And that odd muse of mine, my ver versiple, is with me everywhere, in Carol and in Carr and in my chair. And all the time, and all the time, my love, you too are there beneath the word above the syllable to underscore and stress the vital rhythm one heard a woman's dress rustle in days of yore. I've often caught the sound and sense of your approaching thought. And all in you is youth, and you make new by quoting them off old things I made for you. Dim Gulf was my first book, free verse. Night Wrote came next, then Hebe's Cup my final float in that damp carnival, for now I term everything, quote, poems, end of quote, no longer squirm. But this transparent thingum does require some moon drop title, help me. Will, hail fire. Gently the day has passed in a sustained low hum of harmony, the brain is drained in a brown ament and the noun I meant to use but did not dry on the cement, maybe my sensual love for the conson d'appui echoes fey child is based upon a feeling of fantastically planned, richly rhymed life. I feel I understand. Existence, or at least a minute part of my existence, only through my art in terms of combinational delight, and if my private universe scans right, so does the verse of Galaxies Divine, which I suspect is an iambic line. I'm reasonably sure that we survive. And that, my darling, somewhere is alive, as I am reasonably sure that I shall wake at six tomorrow on July the 22nd, 1959, and that the day will probably be fine. So this alarm clock let me set myself, yawn, and put back Shade's poems on their shelf. But it's not bedtime yet. The sun attains old Dr. Sutton's last two window panes. The man must be, what, 80, 82? Was twice my age the year I married you. Where are you? In the garden? I can see part of your shadow near the shagbark tree. Somewhere horseshoes are being tossed. Click, clunk, leaning against its lamppost like a drunk. A dark Vanessa with a crimson band. Wheels in the low sun settles on the sand and shows its ink blue wingtips flecked with white. And through the flowing shade and ebbing light, a man unheedful of the butterfly, some neighbor's gardener, I guess, goes by, trundling an empty barrow up the lane.